story time with Mr. Beat. What's happening? Specifically, what's happening 150 years ago? I'm Mr. Beat. Here is the story of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Once upon a time, the United States President Abraham Lincoln was sleeping at the White House when he had a horrible dream. A few days later, he described that dream to his friend and bodyguard, Ward Hill Lamone. Quote, There seemed to be a death-like stillness about me. Then I heard subdued sobs, as if a number of people were weeping. I thought I'd left my bed and wandered downstairs. There the silence was broken by the same pitiful sobbing, but the mourners were invisible. I went from room to room. No living person was in sight, but the same mournful sounds of distress met me as I passed along. I saw light in all the rooms. Every object was familiar to me, but where were all the people who were grieving as if their hearts would break? I was puzzled and alarmed. What could be the meaning of all this? Determined to find the cause of a state of things so mysterious and so shocking, I kept on until I arrived at the East Room, which I entered. There I met with a sickening surprise. Before me rested a corpse wrapped in funeral vestments. Around it were stationed soldiers who were acting as guards, and there were a throng of people gazing mournfully upon the corpse, whose face was covered, others weeping pitifully. Who is dead in the White House? I demanded of one of the soldiers. The president, was his answer. He was killed by an assassin. Then came a loud burst of grief from the crowd, which woke me from my dream. While so many Americans loved Abraham Lincoln, the dream supports that he knew many people hated him. One person who openly hated Lincoln was John Wilkes Booth. Booth was basically the Matthew McConaughey of his day. He was a rich and famous actor who many women adored. I mean, look how dreamy he was. Anyway, he was also a racist and a Southern sympathizer during the Civil War. He blamed Lincoln for all of the South's troubles. Being rich and famous and all, Booth tended to always be close to important people and events. In 1859, he was an eyewitness to the execution of John Brown, even standing near the scaffold with other armed men to guard against any attempt to rescue Brown. On November 9, 1863, President Lincoln watched Booth in the role of the villain, Raphael, in The Marble Heart in Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., the same exact place where later he would, well, we will get to that. Here's Lincoln giving his second inaugural address. There's Lincoln, and there's Booth, standing less than 100 feet from him. One other coincidence, Booth's brothers saved the life of Lincoln's oldest son, Robert Todd Lincoln. Anyway, John Wilkes Booth first planned to kidnap the president, and he recruited several buddies to help. Samuel Arnold, George Adzerut, David Harold, Michael O'Laughlin, Lewis Powell, aka Lewis Payne, and John Surratt were all part of the conspiracy. Surratt's mother, Mary, allowed Booth to meet with his co-conspirators at her boarding house in Washington, D.C. The original plan was to kidnap Lincoln and take him to Richmond, Virginia, the Confederate capital. There, they would hold him in return for Confederate prisoners of war, as the Confederates were desperately short of quality soldiers at this stage in the war. On March 17, 1865, the group planned to kidnap President Lincoln while he watched a play at a hospital located on the outskirts of Washington. However, Lincoln changed his plans at the last minute, and the plot failed. Three weeks later, General Robert E. Lee surrendered to General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox, and the American Civil War officially came to an end. Two days later, Lincoln spoke from the White House to a crowd gathered outside. Again, Booth was there. During the speech, Lincoln suggested that voting rights be granted to certain blacks. This made Booth really angry. With the war over, and now Lincoln calling for more rights for people of color, Booth now thought it'd be better to assassinate Lincoln. That is the last speech he will ever give, Booth was quoted as saying. On April 14th, Booth stopped by Ford's Theater to pick up his mail. While there, he learned of Lincoln's plans to attend that evening's performance of Our American Cousin. Booth determined that this was the perfect opportunity. He knew the theater's layout, having performed there several times. He also knew the play really well by heart. That afternoon, Booth also went to Mary Surratt's boarding house in Washington, D.C. and asked her to take a package to her tavern in Surrattsville, Maryland. He also asked Surratt to have guns and ammunition that Booth had previously stored at the tavern ready to be picked up later that evening. That evening, Booth called for a final meeting with his co-conspirators. At that meeting, Booth said that he would kill Lincoln while he watched the play that night. He had also planned on stabbing General Ulysses Grant, but Grant had declined the invitation to go that night, as Mary Todd, Lincoln's wife, and Julia Grant, Grant's wife, didn't get along. 
He also gave orders for George Azurut to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson at the Kirkwood House, a five-star hotel where Johnson was staying. Azurut didn't want to kill Johnson, as he had only signed up for a kidnapping, but Booth was like, there's no turning back now, you're too far in. Booth also ordered Lewis Powell to kill Secretary of State William Seward at his home, with David Harold acting as a guide to help get Powell to the Seward house, and then out of Washington to later meet with Booth in Maryland. All of the attacks were supposed to happen at the same time, just after 10 o'clock that night. President Lincoln and his wife Mary arrived to Fort's Theater late, at about 8.30 p.m. They were joined by Major Henry Rathbone and his girlfriend, Clara Harris. The four sat in a balcony that looked down on the stage. The play actually stopped and the orchestra played Hail to the Chief as the audience gave a standing ovation for the president. Ward Hill Lamone was not available that night to be a bodyguard for Lincoln, so a D.C. police officer named John Parker had been assigned to protect the president. It was interesting that Parker was given such a big responsibility considering he had a record of misconduct and 14 disciplinary infractions. Parker took a seat just outside the president's box, but he couldn't see the stage from there, so later left his post to find better seating. At intermission, Parker then left the theater to have a drink with Lincoln's footman and coachman at a saloon next door. At that very same saloon, likely at the same exact time, John Wilkes Booth was drinking at the bar. Another customer recognized him. Remember, Booth was a celebrity. But instead of asking for an autograph, he rudely said, quote, You'll never be the actor your father was, unquote. Booth reportedly replied, When I leave the stage, I will be the most famous man in America. Meanwhile, back at Ford's Theater, Lincoln had no one protecting him. Booth entered the theater's lobby at about 10.07 p.m. Charles Forbes, the footman who had a drink with Parker, was seated next to the door that entered the president's box. Parker, by the way, was still at the saloon. Booth reportedly handed Forbes a card, and shortly after, Forbes let Booth in. Booth propped the door shut with the wooden leg of a music stand, which he had placed there earlier that day so that no one else could enter the box. At around the same time, George Azarut sat at the bar at the Kirkwood House. He could not work up enough courage to kill Andrew Johnson, so he just sat and drank. While getting drunk at the bar, he may have accidentally said too much, asking the bartender where Johnson was, for example. Azarut never attempted to assassinate Johnson, but he did leave behind evidence that he was thinking about it. At around the same time, Lewis Powell had entered Secretary of State William Seward's home, drawing a knife and punching many of Seward's friends and family to get to him. Powell found Seward lying in his bed, recovering from injuries from a carriage accident a few days before. Powell savagely sliced Seward in the head and throat, but Seward was wearing a metal and canvas splint on his jaw, which remarkably deflected many of the blows. Assuming he was dead and in pursuit by Seward's relatives, Powell escaped, not before knifing and pistol whipping a total of five people in the house. Back at Ford's theater, Booth waited. He knew the play by heart and waited until the actor on stage would say what he thought was the funniest line in the play. As predicted, the time came and the crowd roared with laughter. At this precise moment, Booth came up behind Lincoln, who was also laughing hysterically, and shot him in the head at point-blank range. Mary screamed and Rathbone began wrestling with Booth. Booth pulled out his knife and stabbed Rathbone in the left arm. Booth next jumped 11 feet off the balcony to the stage below. As he hit the floor, he snapped his fibula bone in his left leg, just above his ankle. It was at this point that the audience of more than 1,000 people realized something was wrong. Booth reportedly yelled, Sic Semper Tyrannus, which means, quote, thus always to tyrants, in Latin, flashed his knife at the audience and hurried across the stage. Everything apparently happened so quickly that no one had time to stop him. Booth went out the back door and climbed on the horse he had placed there earlier. He rushed out the city using the Navy Yard Bridge into Maryland. As planned, Booth met up with Harold and they stopped by Surratt's Tavern to pick up his weapons. At around 4 a.m., Booth and Harold arrived at Dr. Mudd's home, where Mudd set and splintered Booth's broken leg. Meanwhile, back in Washington, Lincoln was unconscious. 
After examining Lincoln's head wound, Army Surgeon Charles Leal said the president wouldn't survive a carriage ride to the White House, so he was carried across the street to the home of William Peterson. Many doctors were present, and all of them knew there was pretty much nothing they could do. Lincoln never again regained consciousness and died at 7.22 a.m. on April 15, 1865. That morning, more than 2,000 soldiers rode out of D.C. in search of John Wilkes Booth. Eleven days later, on April 26th, a group of soldiers and detectives caught up to him at the farm of Richard H. Garrett, a tobacco farmer. Booth and Harold had been sleeping in the barn when the soldiers surrounded it and announced they would set the barn on fire in 15 minutes. Harold surrendered, but Booth refused to come out, reportedly saying, I will not be taken alive. After hearing this, the soldiers set fire to the barn. Of course. As the barn went up in flames, Booth stepped toward the doorway with a gun in each hand. At that moment, Sergeant Boston Corbett shot Booth, hitting him in the back of the head. Booth died two hours later. The rest of the conspirators were arrested before the end of the month, except John Surratt, who fled to Quebec and later Europe. Eventually, he was captured in Egypt. Eight people were officially charged with conspiracy. The trial began on May 10th and lasted until June 30th. Lewis Powell was charged with conspiracy and the attempted assassination of Secretary of State William Seward. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. David Harold was charged with conspiracy in aiding Booth's escape. He also was found guilty and also sentenced to death. George Adzerut was charged with conspiracy, also guilty and also sentenced to death. Even though Mary Surratt had very little to do with the conspiracy other than provide a place for the conspiracy to happen, she also was charged with conspiracy and sentenced to death. The four were hanged on July 7, 1865. Surratt was the first white woman in history executed by the United States government. Dr. Samuel Mudd was charged with conspiracy and aiding Booth's escape. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, but President Andrew Johnson pardoned him in February 1869. Sam Arnold was charged with being part of Booth's earlier plot to kidnap Lincoln. He was found guilty and sentenced to life, but was also pardoned by Johnson in 1869. Michael O'Laughlin was also charged with the earlier plot to kidnap Lincoln and sentenced to life in prison. However, he died of yellow fever in prison two years later. Ned Spangler was charged with helping Booth escape from Ford's Theater immediately after the assassination. He was found guilty and sentenced to six years, but was also pardoned by President Johnson in 1869. Lincoln was the first of four presidents in American history to be assassinated while in office. Today, the Secret Service is in charge of protecting the president. Coincidentally, Lincoln signed the legislation creating the Secret Service the very day he was shot. The end.